Continue the chats, the uncomfortable conversation that must happen when your team loses a grand final and what a way they lost. Michael Kroger joins us now uh, from Melbourne. John Anderson, of course, former Deputy Prime Minister. Um, so, Michael, put simply, I, I laid out some things at the start of the show. You may well have missed it, but it was like about future Liberal Party, all the rest of it. We'll get into all this existential stuff in a second. But let's deal with the reality. The government has changed. How do you think the country has changed for the next three years? I talk about how the easy wins for Albo are doing deals with the states. I also should add that I think he's going to do, uh, you know, wage accord, 10-year deals with sort of big business, big unions, big government. Um, but how do you think the joint will change over the next three years? So I think it'll change radically. Uh, Al Bowes come in with all of the usual um, governing for everybody mantra that we hear from every newly elected president or prime minister, even those that didn't vote for us, we're representing right. them, blah, blah, unity, blah. Unity, unity. And he'll, 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 he'll believe this stuff and he'll think he's incredibly popular and he'll try and keep peace within the Labor Party because he's a lefty turn to the right, etc., etc. Uh, he'll think he's an incredibly popular, successful... Labor Prime Minister, and he'll have learned from Gillard, Rudd, etc., etc., until he gets hit by the economic reality stick. And that will hit him hard. Uh, and what it will be, mate, is uh, successive interest rate rises. And I would think next year, that's 2023, towards the end of 23, there'll be a severe world recession um, for all the reasons that we know. And his government will very quickly evaporate and his leadership will too because he will have no idea how to handle it, nor will his team. Uh, and I think Australia is going to be in for a very difficult period uh, in 2023 and 2024. And they've got the wrong man at the helm. John, can I just ask a me mechanical question? Uh, when you win government, when you become the Deputy Prime Minister... The process, because obviously you've played the politics, you covered the job. Tell me about the first two weeks of when you assume such high office. What happens and are there moments where even your preparedness for the moment, you are hit by the enormity of the task? Uh, well, you're certainly hit. Uh, good to be with you and with Michael. Uh, certainly hit by the enormity of the task. And when we went to government, we'd been in opposition for a long time. And the only people who had, had experience in government around the cabinet table were John Howard and John Ball. The rest of us were on a very, very steep learning curve. Can I just step back for a moment, though? It seems to me the first question we should be asking, and, you know, look, credit where credit is due. The Prime Minister is the Prime Minister. He deserves it. He's formed government in the House of Representatives. Uh, as has been pointed out, it must be very worrying for him that less than one in three Australians actually wanted him to be Prime Minister. But what is it about Australia at this point in time when we face massive challenges that there's a strange reluctance to engage with the really big issues that confront us all, many of them external dangers, external enemies even to our future freedom and prosperity, that sees us squabbling with one another as though we're the problem, our fellow Australians. Mm. That's point one. Point two, I am fond of saying you can't get good public policy without a good debate. Now, on these major issues, we're told that climate change is a very big one. I'm not so sure that it plays so heavily in all of Australia. Look, the National Party retained all of its seats. Absolutely. Worth pointing out. And it's painted as a dinosaur on this issue. Now, I'm a farmer. I'm worried about volatility in seasons. It does concern me. I don't take this lightly. But we'll never get the public policy settings right in Australia if we don't agree the facts first. The first fact we have to deal with is that we know from the research that Australians, probably because of the rhetoric that is so freely thrown around, believe that we are responsible for 10 to 20% of the world's emissions. I mean, it's extraordinary. Right. It's right. actually... 1.1, 1.2, and as a proportion of global emissions coming down, I don't I mean most people don't know that. Uh, next point, we're told uh, to accept the science. Well, the ch former chief scientist, Alan Finkel, a man I have an enormous regard for, acknowledged in a Senate uh, response to a question recently that no matter what we do in this country, we can't have a significant impact. That's not to say we shouldn't be active. But we need to actually face the reality. We are not the major problem here. The next thing we need to get on with is to say that adaptation is going to be important, that technology is going to be important, that we cannot and should not risk our economic, 
and fuel security and defence intertwined, if you like, responsibilities of the Commonwealth Government to look after us all. And here's a final point as a farmer, whether we like it or not, I heard the earlier useful comments about what's happened in Britain where they changed direction so quickly, as has Germany, a left of centre government with a green foreign minister acknowledging that they have to go back, you know, on their green policies. So only 12% of Germany's energy, despite being the greenest of the Western nations, is now generated by renewables, and they've got to retreat even from that. Let me make another point. The Bank of England is warning of global food catastrophe issues by the end of this year. We cannot produce food without reliable and copious quantities of affordable diesel and gas. Half the world's grain production is dependent upon nitrogen as urea produced overwhelmingly from gas. We have to deal with the cards that are on our table and drop the high emotion and be honest with one another about what we can and can't do and to balance these things up. I'm really concerned that we're not as a nation prepared to engage with the things that threaten us all. Michael, it feels like whenever you either have uh, an improbable victory or a tight victory, whatever it happens to be, be you a minority government or a surprise government, that, that what ends up seeping into things is that you feel like you're only there just, which means you triage things for three years rather than make the most of your numbers to try to do something, let alone the compromises that have to be made in the Senate. For coalition governments, that was essentially, uh, you know, relatively conservative crossbench, but there could be poison pills dropped in by a Jackie Lambie who looks like she's got a second person at a Tassie, all the rest of it. So how do... I mean, Albanese's going to be in this position where... At the best-case scenario tonight, it's 77, but it's most likely 76, and that's with, you know, everything falling their way. How do you make the big changes? Is Labor able to do that because they have caucus discipline? They don't have the scenario like the religious freedom bill where four people can run away and then it's mm. all dead on day mm. one? Mate, absolutely. It's much easier for them in the reps to get legislation through because they'll get every vote for it and none against and no abstentions because we know what happens if people don't vote that way. But then, of course, it gets to the Senate and who knows what that dog's breakfast will look like in a couple of weeks' time. Uh, it's going to be incredibly messy. And for Labor to put together a majority vote, uh, they'll obviously need the Greens and then good luck after that. So, you know, we are in for a difficult legislative time um, with... with you know, and, and you know, a number of us had said on Sky, some of us have been criticised for it, but I, I'm, I'm of the view I'd prefer the Albanese government to be a majority than having to deal with, the, with this mishmash of independence. Uh, you know, I'd I prefer agree Albany to get to 76, not 74. Uh, I agree yeah, with thanks, you. Thanks, John. Yeah, I, I mean, yeah, look, you, you know, you don't want a country where no one knows what will happen in the reps with any legislation. And no one knows what that'll happen in the Senate. This is this is a recipe for paralysis uh, in this country. And quickly, the foreign capital markets look at Australia and downgrade us. So, let's hope Albo gets to 76 because we can't get there. But in answer to your question, Paul, uh, it's going to be a long, slow process because no one has any idea how things will go in the Senate. Oh, look, I agree completely about. Look, I want governments to be majority governments so they can get on with it. Um, you know, in the case of the Liberal Party, you want them to have bigger majorities. So those that want to, you know, yep. make a protest, all the rest of it, they can go somewhere else and you at least still get a way to get through as soon as you end up sort of, you know, dead level, one in front. Then, of course, everyone can become sort of the political suicide bomber. But, John, back to that that fundamental point, right? And I, and, and I love having this bit of the conversation. Not as fiery as the normal show and, you know, all the rest of it, but it's really the, it's, it's the, it's the, it's the main meal, right? Yeah. which is our politics has paid at such a volume and at such a pace, left, right, centre, media, all the rest of it, right? Mm. It feels like it is impossible to have a complicated conversation because if you try yeah. to put forward the nuanced um, That's right. difference, somehow yeah. that's you taking the same side mm. as the most extreme person who has no idea what they're talking about. Exactly. Well, this is a great problem with... Um, identity politics where we've tribalised and we have divorced the idea of virtue and character from our assessment of another person and we attach it now to ideas. So if you agree with my ideas, you're a good person, you're virtuous. If you don't, you ought to be silenced. 
you've got to be cut out of the scene. And we're, th we're throwing away the capacity to find consensus and you do not, you cannot get good public policy out of a bad debate. That's why I dwelt for a moment on climate. We're getting very bad debate and a lot of standoff because we're not confronting the real limitations of what we can do as well as, or, or the real possibilities of what we can do and how we really seek to be good global citizens. An obvious point being, we can help feed a world that's facing a global food crisis, but it means we have to be realistic about the fact that we need a lot of fossil fuel energy to do it. That's a moral cause in its own right, and it needs to be recognised as not being. So you're absolutely right. This is one of the great problems of, you know, the 30-second grab, which is now morphed into addiction to social media, you know, where the, the sort of the spontaneous, the clever wit, the nastiness outweighs clever, considered proper debate and the nation is the loser. And, you know, I was on the polling booth yesterday and a very nice and agreeable and intelligent young Australian came up to me and he said, I don't know how to vote. Can you give me some ideas of what the issues are? So my point is more that he's a victim. <laughs> I don't like using that word. He should step up a bit, I'll say that. <laughs> a, a, a bit of a culture we a, live in. How does he get information? How does he actually understand when you have a federal election debate in Australia in the most dangerous economic and strategic environment the country has ever lived in and we've thought about everything internally that we can disagree on and not focused on the things that we ought to be able to agree on in terms of our national freedoms and, and moving forward. You've hit the nail on the head. We have a crisis in terms of our ability to find the right language, the right means to talk properly. And I've noticed the dumbing down of the parliament. There are still notable exceptions. But when I went in, there were people on both sides who had deeply held philosophical worldviews that were very impressive with a real ability to put them. So they'd have an idea of what sort of Australia they wanted and they could evaluate each policy setting against that long-term vision. Well, no one has that long-term vision anymore now, so we get this sort of short-term ad hocery, on the run opportunism, which is, of course, you know, only fed the cynicism, I think, in the Australian community.